everyone to this uh, today joint seminar between CCSE and Mechanical Engineering. So today is a pleasure to present uh, Professor Ellen Kulf. She is a professor at Mechanical Eng Engineering at the Stanford University. She's also the chair of Mechanical Engineering. Um, so Ellen, she got her PhD in Stuttgart in 2000, and she's broadly interested in uh, physics-based uh, modeling using artificial intelligence and uh, and, and also some machine learning tools, and I think that this is going to be the, the talk about today. Uh, just as part of the logistics, uh, usually what we do, we take the questions at the very end. Uh, so unless you, Ellen, want to make it more interactive, we are also happy doing that. The only problem is the mic. So if you want to ask a question, just raise your hand, and then I will pass you the mic so the people on Zoom can also uh, listen to the question. So, yeah, without any further ado, yeah, okay. please yeah, go thank ahead. Thank you, and thank you for inviting me. Yeah, feel free to ask questions uh, anytime. And at Stanford, we have a chair. You don't have one right now in mechanical engineering. So, um, what I'm going to talk about is I'm going to talk about uh, model discovery. That's something that came up, came to our attention over the last year or so. And we've done this, um, talked to a lot of people at conferences when conferences started again. And that's the main work of Kevin Linker, who was actually a postdoc at Stanford during the pandemic. And I never met him for nine months because we were all in lockdown. And then he went back to Europe and I had never seen him. And he did all this great work. And then Sarah St. Pierre is a PhD student at Stanford. Adrian Buganza is a former student in our group who is now an associate professor at Purdue. And then Gerhard Holzapfel is, uh, many of you might know, uh, an expert in soft tissue biomechanics. And we've done a lot of testing with him. So I'm going to show experiments that we have done in his lab. So when we in engineering talk about modeling, we talk about um, a physical model. So these are physical models that we typically uh, analyze to study the human brain. And the idea of all these models that they have in common is what you see here. So we're mechanical engineers, and we calculate stresses. So um, stresses in the brain are interested for many different in interesting for many different reasons. They're interesting to understand the failure of the brain, the behavior of the brain during injury. And you can see we do usually finite element simulations to have a high resolution of these stresses. And this is because we cannot model them, uh, measure them. So you have no way to measure the stresses in your brain. So it really needs simulation. And so to do this, um, we want to find a model that maps deformation or forces into one another and to ma map forces into deformations, we need to know um, the stiffness. And if you look at the brain, this is a map of all kinds of tissues. The brain is really, on the very left, the most um, soft tissue you can think of. Its stiffness is on the order of one kilopascal. It's much, much, or this is on a logarithmic scale, it's much, much softer then what you see, um, fat tissue, liver, lung, heart, cartilage, and then bone obviously being kind of like this, um, the stiffest. So because it's so soft, it's really, really hard to test. And we went out to do that about eight years ago with a student in our lab, um, Sylvia Budai, who was jointly um, advised between Stanford and Erlangen in Germany. And so Sylvia did a lot of testing on the brain. And I'm going to show you, uh, first of all, her testing results. So the first thing we did is, we wanted to know how soft is soft, so we took the brain and did nano indentation and punctured it. And then we also put a slice of jello. And what you can see here is that the brain is even about half as stiff as jello. So it's really, really soft. One thing you can appreciate from the slice of brain in the petri dish is when you put it in the dish, it immediately flattens out. So it's actually very, very fluidic almost and fills the, the entire dish. So the number kind of to remember is on the order of one um, kilopascal. Um, this is, of course, not enough information because when you poke into the brain, you only get the stiffness response in one direction, in the response to poking. But when you want to understand the whole brain in response to injury, you want to understand its behavior to different types of loading. And so if you reduce the loading into the main modes, it's usually compression and tension and shear. So this is a device in Gerd Holzapfel's lab. It's a typical triaxial tester, and it's able to use a single probe that you can mount, and then you can write, run a protocol that does all these kind of tests in, our, in a sequence. So here we did tests in tension, compression, and shear on one and the same brain sample. And you can see the samples there. So the top one 
is a little bit darker, so that's the gray matter substance of the brain, and the lower one is the white matter substance. We try to cut little cubes that are all five by five by five millimeters, and you can already see that they sink already when you cut them, so you have to correct for that size change. Um, and here is kind of like what it uh, looks like. So we had, we were lucky to get human brains. So these are 10 human brains. You see these slices are really very different. Um, so not one brain ever looks like another. These were um, the 10 samples. And we cut some, um, so cut pieces out of these slices from the cortex and the basal ganglia. So that was the gray matter that you've seen on top. And then the corona radiator and the corpus callosum. So that's the white matter somewhere in this region here and the corpus callosum is across here. So we had a lot of samples, altogether probably 200, and this is what a single one sample from brain eight from the cone radiator looks like. So on top you see a compression test, and then you see shear, compression, and tension. And there's a couple of things to note. So first of all, when we look at this, we would all agree this is not linear. So it's not linear. We also see that it doesn't behave the same in loading and unloading, and we also see that every load cycle kind of produces a little bit of a different response. So it's conditioning, it's hysteretic, and then if you compare the numbers on these curves, it's also non-symmetric in tension and compression. So these are things you want the model in a way to capture. So now I'm gonna try to, um, first of all, show how it looks like for all brains. So you can see these four regions, cortex, basal ganglia, coronary radiator, and corpus callosum. You can see, for instance, you can appreciate that there's a huge variation. So the shading is the standard, vari uh, standard deviation and the solid line is the mean across something like 20, 30 samples. And then you can see it has different values in different regions and also different values in different tests. So now we want to find uh, a model that maps these um, strains, shear or stretch, onto stresses, right? And there's different ways to do it. And obviously in the literature, people have done this over many, many, many years. And for those of you who do take mechanic stresses, you're probably familiar with many of these names. Uh, so if you do a finite element simulation, you have the first thing you have to do is have to select a model. And we are, for instance, using Abacus, and Abacus has a library of 100 different models, and these are part of them. There's another 95. So you would find the simplest model is the Neo-Hookian model. I think most of us know that. That's a linear behavior, linear relation between stress and stretch. But there's also the mooney rivlin model that's very popular for rubber. That's a model that has been proposed for soft tissues. This is a model for rubber. And then the Octan model also many of you might be familiar with. So the first step in modeling is to select a model. And this is actually where um, it becomes troublesome because you have to actually know these models because how else would you select one, right? So it's really a matter of your experience and also a matter of personal preference, which of these models you select. And what I'm trying to show you now in the next uh, couple of minutes is how can we circumvent this all together and not ever, ever, ever in life have to s select a model ourselves again. And if this works, so there was the idea, then you never need to take a continuum mechanics class anymore how to select models or what models there are. It puts some people out of work. <laughs> so. First of all, the naive approach is we all know about machine learning. It's a super powerful tool. It allows us to map functions, um, like a value onto um, a function output. And this is just a deep neural net with just the simplest way you can think of. It has two hidden layers, so two columns. It has eight nodes in each layer. Uh, this particular network where everything is connected, this is fully connected, it has 80 weights, so that's all the errors. And then it has 17 biases, so there's a couple of errors coming from the bottom. So altogether, there's 97 unknowns. Uh, when you train this network, you feed data, and you try to minimize the difference between the output of the network and the output that you have measured. So in this case, we would f feed in the stretch on the sample. We would read out the force or pressure that it produces, and we try to match the f um, this pair of stretch force um, in a loss function with what uh, we have measured and what we have predicted by this network. So that would be how we train the network. Um, we have to select one more thing. On all these arrows here, um, you activate, when you pass information one, from one layer to next, you activate the values and you do this with activation functions. And there's just a collection here of popular activation functions that people use. 
So you can see they vary a lot. You can just select them when you run the network. The very popular one in our case that people use a lot is this one here. It's a hyperbolic tangent function, and you can probably guess why. It starts with uh, at minus 1, it goes to plus 1, and it has a very smooth transition. So it's a function that's limited at both ends and also is very smooth. It has a smooth derivative, so it's very popular to do uh, these kind of things. There's obviously also a whole library of others. Some have jumps, some are even dis discontinuous, but they might be useful for other purposes. So I'm going to show you an application of using this tangent hyperbolic function as a motivation, what it would do if you try to fit data points. So this is data points from a typical experiment. I'm using the tangent hyperbolic function in all the nodes in this color nodes of this network here. And you can see it fits quite well, which probably many of you would say it's no surprise, right? We're trying to fit 97 uh, unknowns of this network onto just these few points that we have. And so you can see a few things that work well, so the points all get fit very nicely, but there are a few things that don't work well, and I'm trying to address them in the following. So the first one is, uh, in the very first top, you can see the nature of this tangent hyperbolic function is that at some point it decays and flattens out. That's just what this function does. And so if you look at the curves and uh, the points that people have measured when you pull on something, there's actually no reason physically or just intuitively to believe that it flattens out. So it would probably increase, right? So it, the model fails to extrapolate between its training regime. So you train on these points, but once you beyond the last point, in this case, with this particular activation function, it would flatten out, and it would produce a result that's non-intuitive, right? Um, another one is it always activates all these tangent uh, functions, and every time you run it again, it activates them at a different rate uh, or amplitude. And so these parameters, these weights that activate these functions really have no physical meaning, and that's probably the main downside. So we train something, we learn something, we fit something, but there's really no value to it other than fitting. And then this is something that we don't see as clearly as here usually. Here it's very, very clear. When you look at this, you would also all say, um, why are there all these waves, right? So this is a non-physical solution. You would estimate this curve to actually be monotonic. Um, and this actually violates com common laws of thermodynamics. And it also performs very poorly on, on sparse data. So I'll try to address this, uh, and the idea is um, to design a network that, by design, addresses all these shortcomings. We've done this with Kevin, so you see Kevin here and Sarah. And the idea on, is on the, red, on the right hand side, we manipulate part of the input to the network. On the left hand side, we manipulate, or th on the left hand side, the input. On the right hand side, we manipulate the output. And by doing this, we can address, as you've taken uh, continuum mechanics or solid mechanics classes, we can address material objectivity, material symmetry incompressibility, all of this by just this input. And the way we do this is rather than feeding the stretch or the deformation gradient, we feed the invariance of the stretch or the invariance of the deformation gradient. And this can be the first three, or it can be even anisotropic invariance that take into account special directions. Then we apply these functions, but you can also see this network is not fully connected here. And because of this architecture, the way this is chosen, we actually satisfy polyconvexity. We also need to do a couple of other things. So we need to select specific activation functions to make sure this is polyconvex and uh, satisfies physical growth constraints. And then also we satisfy thermodynamics by not interpolating the stress, but by interpolating the free energy and then deriving in a post-processing the free energy from the, uh, the stress from the free energy. So the idea is, if we do this, do we have a network that satisfies all this physics by design? And then can we actually have the network itself detect both the model and the parameters both at the same time without having to interfere with it? So I'll show you a very first uh, prototype simple thing to get started. This is a very simple real network that we're using. And we use this for rubber, and rubber is nice in some ways, so I'm going back from the brain to first do it on something where people know exactly what these functions look like. And I've tried this a lot over the last 60, 70 years. And so here I'm using the first and second invariant of the deformation gradient. I use a linear function on it and a square. So this second layer has uh, four nodes. And then I apply the identity and an exponential on all these terms. 
So at the end of the day, I have eight different terms. And the model that I'm going to discover is going to represent a combination of these eight terms. So as in total, there are two to the power of eight combinations of terms. So I could possibly detect 256 different models. And the price is very cheap because we have eight weights here, we have eight weights here, and then four of them are actually redundant because they map onto the identical identity. So it's only 12 unknowns. So it's relatively easy to learn. So let me show you how this works. I feed some uh, deformation into it, I read some stress out, and then I try to fit uh, these color-coded terms. So this is how the activation functions look like. They're now different, they are not bounded. So for instance, this one is not um, bounded between minus one and one, and that's actually nice because our free energy function is typically not bounded between minus one and one. Um, this is what these functions would look like if you apply them in uniaxial tension, equibiaxial tension, and pure shear to the first and second invariant. So in the following, all the red colored terms, the hot terms, are the first invariant. The green and blue terms are on the second invariant. And I map out the stresses, and you'll see each term, how much it contributes to the, the overall fit. The data that I'm going to use uh, are data that are in the literature, well reported. A lot of people have studied. It's kind of like a very good benchmark. And um, one that a lot of people use is this Treloa data from 1944. And that's come some of these curves here. And it's nice because for those data, there are already models that are uh, a good fit for this. So I have, or we have um, digitized all these data and a ton more. So if you're interested in using this and trying this out, um, the code for what I'm going to show and also the data are all available here. Um, so this is a fit of the tangent hyperbolic network with the classical um, neur neural network for the Trelaw data. And you can see uh, two different data sets. So at the top, you see rubber at 20, tested at 20 degrees and at the bottom at 50 degrees. So it's slightly different at different temperatures. And then on the left, you see uniaxial tension, equibiaxial tension, and pure shear. So similar to before, you can fit these curves nicely with this a classical neural network. What I'm now going to show is how does this new network perform on this, and can we actually read out some inter information uh, uh, on these weights. So this is, again, the same data. And this is the network now that we have just designed with the 12 unknowns and the um, 8 to, to the power of 8 different functions. And you can see, actually, this is a nice fit. There's one problem with this, and that is that um, well, one nice thing at first is a lot of weights train to zero. So for instance, here it tries to approximate this function with only three terms, right? Mm -hmm. But then there's no reason to believe that these terms should be different for these three models, because now we're just fitting this individually. And it seems there's a lot of freedom to fit these terms to this. So it's, in a way, an overdetermined problem. So what I'm now going to do is I'm going to fit everything together for um, tension, uh, for tension, equibiaxial tension, and pure shear. And then I'm going to try to interpret these uh, weights. So now the picture looks much clearer. So at top, we have three functions or functional terms that pop out. So the dark red, the middle red, and then the turquoise. And all these three terms make up the function that you see on top. So that's the free energy function that the model discovers. And with the free energy function, we can derive the stresses. And you can see the stresses fit in these th uh, three plots. And you can see they fit the points not exactly, not as good as before, but we also have less degrees of freedom. You can translate the weights from the network into, for instance, um, the shear modulus here. So it's 0 0.23. If you look at the other um, experiment at 50 degrees Celsius, again, we discover three terms. The first two are the same. And then the third is slightly different. The third is in, the, in terms of the uh, second invariant. So you can read out the terms here. You, this is the color code for your stresses here. And what you see is a large chunk is actually covered by this linear term, the neo hookian term. And then the second largest is the exponential term. So this is nice. So we have discovered out of these 200 models, a model with only three terms that actually fits this well. And the weights of the network have a physical interpretation in terms of these parameters of this function, right? So now I want to come back to the brain, because the brain is a little more complex. And so here we have 
more functions actually that we want to incorporate. So in this case, I do the same, but I add a logarithmic function. So now everything has um, the identity, the exponential and the logarithmic function. So there's a total of 12 to choose from. So it gives us two to the power of 12 different combinations, which is on the order of 4,000 and we have 20 weights. So running the same now on the brain data. And this is our reverse engineered activation functions um, for uh, these, this network. These are all the data, just showing what Sylvie has collected. And again, you find this here if you want to take it and just run it, and you don't need to type this up. Um, and these are the three brain regions. So there's a corona, corona radiator, um, corpus callosum. So the bottom is the white matter, and then on top you have the same for the gray matter. And here you see how many samples. So for instance, in this batch, there were 39 samples uh, of over which this is averaged. This is what it looks like. So this is just the data for gray matter. And this is mapping out the tension, the first column, compression, second column, and shear, third column. And you realize that there's a really great fit on the diagonal. And that is because what in machine learning terms we use for training. So here we really use these data to fit the points. So on the a, a diagonal, you have a good fit of the points. You also have very high R2 values, so that's the goodness of fit. You want this to be close to one. On the off diagonal, the fit is less good. And this in machine learning terms is what we call testing. So we have not used this information. We have just predicted it based on the, um, on the training. So these are just predictions of the trained model with the, with the other um, experiments. And then here, to top it off on the right, we train all three combined. For this training with all three sets combined, we find something really interesting. So we find only blue terms. So you can look up the legend, the blue terms, or you recall what I said earlier, the blue terms are terms in terms of the second invariant. So this is interesting because this suggests that the best fit you would get for the brain data is with a model that captures only the second invariant. So these models are not the first invariant models that people always use don't even seem to be relevant. And this is what this model does fully automatically without any interaction. The function you can see on top has four terms. If I move to another brain region, um, the message stays the same. You can, fit, uh, you can train well on the diagonal. You can test well for some of the tests. And if you train everything together, you're left with four terms. The function is on top. Here are the color codes and these function Functional terms are also only terms in terms of the second invariant. Um, you can see the parameters that we can extract from this, right? For instance, from these terms, you can extract the shear modulus of 0 0.44, and then exponential terms um, as they're listed there. So this for all regions, and in every region, we only discover blue color-coded second invariant terms. So that's an, a, an interesting message, because for brain, we had not a good comparison. For rubber, it was kind of clear there was something to compare to. But here, what this suggests is actually the, first, the second invariant describes brain quite well. I want to come back to the special cases. Um, and I have now color coded them here. So there are a couple of special cases that you can drag out of this network because we have kind of reverse engineered the activation functions such that this network generalizes all these models. So there are a couple that you can recover, and you do just very simple. You would, for instance, set er all these weights you force to be zero and just allow this first, you train only these first weights, right? And then you end up with a new, new Hookian model. If you only go this green path and set everything else to zero, the model that you recover is the Blatsko model. If you only go this red path here, then it's the Dimray model. So you can also recover that. And then there's also models with multiple terms. So the Mooney Rivlin model is the green and the dark red. And so just you can use the same structure and architecture if you want to just do parameter identification and you know the model. But the point actually I'm trying to make is that you don't even need to know the model. It discovers it automatically. If we were to do this, and you can see this here color-coded, um, there's the fit for Neohook, Blatsko, Dimray, and Holzapfel. Those are all one-term models, and the color code here corresponds to the Holzapfel term. So we only activate this term. If we only activate these terms, we can find, for instance, the shear modulus that's related to this term is 1.9. The shear modulus that's related to this term here is 1.8. So 
So that's really also an interpretation, again, of the parameters. Now I want to compare the performance of these individual models that I've just shown here with these colors to the new model that I've proposed. So you can see here the color code for these models. And you can see in gray the models that I'm proposing where the model itself discovers the terms and mainly terms in terms of the second invariant. So again, what you see is on the diagonal, all models train well. So if you give them the data, they, try they are capable of fitting the points. You can see that they don't test all equally well. So on the off diagonal, the testing, so for instance, I give it the tension data and want to predict, does it predict the shear or the compression? And then here is how does it behave if we train on all data sets combined? So now we can step back. It's a, a really a lot of information in this one figure. But what stands out is that this model that we have just automatically discovered without doing anything to it, this gray model here, outperforms all the colored models in average. So it always has the higher um, goodness of fit value close to one or closer to one. So we can actually say the discovered model is actually outperforming these models. We could have done this by hand. We could have tried all 4,000 models, but it would have taken a long, long time. And so now we have just, with an optimization, discovered this model automatically. There's another information contained in this figure, and that is what is the best experiment. So you can actually add up all the R squared values over the, each column, and then you can say what information gives you the, which experiments give you the most information if you were only to do one. And turns out that the tension experiment altogether has the highest um, R2 values. So if you can only do one test, then you want to do a tension test. It gives you the most information out of one experiment. OK, so w when we submitted this, um, people were saying, well, how about other models? This is only invariant models. And so then um, Sarah in our lab said, OK, I can try to do um, principal stretch-based models. And you probably are familiar, or many of you might be familiar with the Octane model. So the octane model, instead of using invariance here from the deformation gradient, uses the principal, principal stretches. So there are three principal stretches, and the octane model takes exponents of them, adds them up, and subtracts three, and then adds them all together with weights. So this only has one layer. Um, and for instance, this model has 20 different combinations. So we use a fixed exponent here, varying from minus 30 to plus 10 and steps of two, so we have 20 different terms, and then uh, we have 20 parameters to learn, or 20 weights. So if we do it for this model, the activation functions look something like this. So on top for tension compression, uh, and the bottom for shear, you can see they are different between minus 30 and plus 10, so they take different shapes. Actually, for instance, on top what you see is the negative values have a tension compression asymmetry with a stiffer compression, and the positive values have a tension compression asymmetry with a stiffer tension. So that actually is a parameter that can fine tune um, your tension compression asymmetry that we've seen in the experiment. So again, we start with the cortex. You can see we can fit well on the diagonal, we can tr test relatively well on the off diagonal, and we can train everything combined. Now, in contrast to the previous model here, and also for all other brain regions, um, we discover a broad spectrum of color codes. And that's actually not what we were hoping to see. We were hoping that there would be a one crystallized term, or two, or three as before. But this is very clear, because these terms lie actually very close together, right? So they're very near, whether you take something to minus 16, minus 18. So they're not as nicely orthogonal as the other 12 terms. And so it's difficult for the optimizer to choose between these terms. And so what it does is it's activating a broad spectrum of terms. None of them really are in this blue range. So these would actually correspond to the first invariant and the red color to the second. So they all, again, favor the, the same trend as before. But there's too many terms, so we didn't like that. And it's not really model discovery if your model discovers everything that's out there. So what we then did is um, Sarah tried um, a regularization. And that's just to show you that you can potentially reduce the number of terms by applying regularization. You see on top the loss function that we are solving. And now Sarah has added a term 
that is um, a penalizing term, uh, and it's an L1 regularization, so it's penalize, penalizing the, uh, number, the um, sum of all weights. And the penalty factor is this alpha, and you can see here for varying alpha, so this is alpha zero as before, and then this is alpha 0 0.1, this is alpha one, and this is alpha 10. You can see how much you can actually reduce this to only single one function. But you pay a price, the fit here is worse than the fit here. So in a way, the regularization is always a balance between do you want a good fit or do you want to reduce your number of terms? I would say this is probably a good fit. It clearly identifies one term on the order of something like minus 24 or so. Um, and so that could be used for model discovery. Again, we can recover um, classical models. So Neohook on top, Blatsko, Muni Rivlin, Ogden are special cases of this. And I can show you how the special cases perform compared to the others. So these are Ogden models with only one of these colored terms. So different exponents, minus 18, minus 20, minus 22, blah, blah. And these are the models that you've seen before, Neohook, Blatsko, Muni Rivlin, and one term Ogden. And they all, again, have a mu parameter that we can extract from this. And the literature has a value between 1.4 and 2.1, so we all kind of lie in this range. And then in the error plot, um, this was nice. So now you know how to read this. You've already seen this part of it. What we've added is this green part here. So these are the two new um, models that are stretch-based. And if you look at all the R values, they have the highest R value. So the stretch-based network is actually better than the invariant-based network, the gray. So it seems to be better to fit what the brain really does. All right, so what do we do to recapture? We use this to actually simulate the brain. So this is something that goes into the correlation between, say, if you want to calculate the forces on the football player's um, brain, you have a hit. You see how the um, force propagates through the brain in terms of stresses, how the brain deforms, and you can make all these correlations. And to do that, you really need stiffnesses and constitutive models. So now everybody can just use any of these and plug them into a finite element model. Um, just to show that this generalizes, we have also done it for skin. Um, and this is slightly different because, um, as you know, if you look at your skin, you have these lines. They're called Langer lines. They are the orientation of um, collagen fibers in the skin. They are stiffer than the rest of the skin, and you can represent them through the first, fourth and fifth invariant. So we have two more, the rest remains the same. And we also actually learn the angle of the fiber. So when we sa sample this, we can learn in which direction it is the stiffest as we train the network. Here are the data. Again, you can find those. We use data from the literature just to compare against. This is the oldest skin experiments and bio -exper um, extension that's reported from 1974. And this is new data that Adrian Muganza has collected in his lab at Purdue. And so um, you can see this is the very original old data. And the nice thing about this model is it discovers two terms. So I think you want to just probably now focus on only the results. So there's two um, terms discovered. One is a turquoise term, which is an exponential of the fourth invariant. And then there's uh, this term here, an exponential of the first invariant. So that's nice. So there's actually two terms. Everything else trains to zero automatically without lasso, or we don't have to do any L1 regularization. Here the terms are orthogonal enough to not be activated. Um, here are the special cases of the model. So there's, again, different cases for uh, skin that people have proposed. I want to draw attention to this model, and this is the holds up a model. So you can see it has a dark red and a turquoise term. It has a linear term in terms of first invariant and exponential term in terms of fourth invariant. It's a very popular model. Most people use this for um, soft tissues. It has become the, the, the number one model, I would say. And you can see where it fits in this network. If you use this model um, and set everything else by hand to zero, you can see in this figure why it's not the best of all models. So on the top, you can see it tries to fit an exponential behavior orthogonal to the fiber direction, so extracellular matrix behavior that is exponential. And it tries to fit it with a line simply because this term that it's using is a linear term. So that's not good, right? And so. If you just run it over the uh, model discovery, 
instead of this term, it discovers an exponential term to fit this behavior. And in a way, you can think of this as a de decomposition where the top fits the off axis behavior, so the orthogonal to the fiber, the extracellular matrix, and the bottom has the extracellular matrix plus the fiber direction behavior. So now how does our model do? Our model picks up this exponential and it actually discovers this term automatically. And that was interesting because we had this discussion with Gerhard Holzapfel and if you Google this model, it's like cited thousands of times and then he's like, oh, I see, that makes actually sense. So then this was something that people have used and that actually is an easy fix of what uh, people have been using. And just to show you how it quantitatively compares, so these are the, the goodness of fit of the classical um, Holzapfel model with um, this term. And now actually, because these values are relatively low, there has been a new version, and for those people who work with this, you might know that there is this version that has a dispersion term where there is a first invariant in the exponential. And that has just been proposed, I don't know, like eight years after the first or so, and they realized themselves by trial and error that they want to put an exponential function on the first invariant as well. This is their original classical model, and then look at the error bars, how they changed, so they are much, much, or the, the goodness of it just goes up in all uh, terms if you do the test and use this exponential term. Again, you can also look at this and say, what's the best experiment? If you only have one experiment to test a fibrous material, and that's actually a thought experiment for you. If you have a material that has a fiber, and you know the fiber direction, how would you want, with one experiment, to get the most information out of it? Would you want to pull orthogonal and not activate the fiber? Would you want to pull in the direction of the fiber or any angle? And what this gives you, so a lot of people say 45 degrees because it's kind of like your intuitive idea. What this gives you, so this is 45 degrees and this is 30 degrees. And actually the R value is the largest for the 30 degrees. So if you pull about 30 degrees off of the fiber direction, then you get the most information. Uh, simply, I think, because this, it's stiffer and you get more information out of this than pulling into both directions equally. So that was also an interesting finding that just came out of the, the machine learning. Okay, what do we do with this? We model skin and we model stresses on skin. So this is skin growth. Um, this is skin pre-stretch. This is skin um, wrinkling. So all of these models um, need stiffnesses. So for instance, for wrinkling, what you need is the ratio of the stiffness on top and underneath, um, and that gives you um, the, the distance of different wrinkles and the depth of the wrinkles. So all of these models really require the stiffness as core, so it's very, very important. Just uh, two quick examples to top off. So one thing that's currently in the work is can you also do this for viscous experiments, and that's something that one student in our lab, Lucy, is currently working on for muscle. This is looking at the passive um, properties of muscle, and this has three, three different um, loading ranges and th three different velocities of loading. So if you want to test something viscous, you also need to test at different rates. So these are the different rates, and these are the different magnitudes. And you can see this is training with one of five, so it trains on the diagonal and tries to fit the rest. And then on the next slide, I'm gonna show you what it looks like if you train with four and try to fit the diagonal, so you train on the off diagonal and test on the diagonal, so this is the other set of experiments. So it's training four or five. And this is the error, so you can see um, this is now the normalized um, error, and you can see that the yellow model, which is the invariant based model, or the octane network outperform classical neural networks, which are these first two. I haven't shown all the theory, but that's just as a currently still in the making. Okay, so this is almost the end. Um, one thing that we have done with this is actually we've gone into class. So we have a class, it's called Soft Tissue Biomechanics. It's ME287 at Stanford, and the students form uh, small groups and they test soft tissues. And so we've said, what better way to, than to crowdsource a group of students who have no idea about all these constitutive models. So they have done tests and they actually have done tension compression and oscillatory tests, and then they have just applied it to this method. And these are um, Sarah and Divya and um, Ethan, and they have done it on artificial meat. And that's something where we really don't know the properties. And so they have tested artificial meat 
in tension compression shear and in all three combined and try to fit this. Um, this here is not <laughs> a good fit and we all agree and the reason why this is not good is because the shear test actually only went up to very small shears and we're trying to predict um, out of the range where we really have tried to fit so this is far out of the training range and so that's why this actually oscillates in the same here on top. Um, but other than that, the method seems to work. We can get stiffnesses for these artificial meat products. Uh, one is chicken and one is tofurkey. And we can actually apply the method and see um, how we can extract back out the stiffness properties, back out a good constituent model. Uh, you can see it discovers three terms, so it's actually a nice way to kind of down select from all the possible terms if you have really no idea um, like some of the students in this class. All right, so this is the end of the talk, and I've hope, uh, I hope I have conveyed some of the message and the excitement of using this. Um, it could potentially be a method that could replace the selection of models. So we're currently working with a finite element company, and they want to put this in front of their finite element modeling pipeline. So what they want to do is they want to just take the stretch stress responses from experiments, and then they would say, okay, you b select the model and then you tell us which of these eight or 15 terms we need to activate, right? And because these terms are all modular, they can put all 18 terms and they can just put them on and off and then combine, combine it to this huge set of models. And that would eliminate for you, if you want to find an element simulation, to ever have to choose which model you want to use. And for them, it's actually nice because they don't need 15 different material subroutines, they just need this one. Um, so let's just go back. So rather than selecting the model, we have automated this. So at the same time, we find the model and parameters, and we don't need to do anything ourselves. This, this code would do it for you. We've put up the network such, and that's how we have engineered it or reverse engineered it, that it satisfies the thermodynamics up front. So I've not gone in all the details, but it has all these typical things when you take continuum mechanics one, there's all this law, um, material objectivity, material symmetry, fully convexity. So that's all built in. We don't need to bother about that. Um, we have reverse engineered the activation functions from a subset of functions that actually generalize to a lot of uh, familiar constitutive models. We can then discover model and parameters. And what's most important is that we can learn something. So I've shown you a couple of anecdotes what we have learned from this. So if we had just used off-the-shelf neural network, we would have no idea about the stiffness at the end. We would not have been able to predict a tension test from a shear test. So there would be no correlation be between any of these things. And then overall, um, we hope that this can make a change and make it easier for people to model and more people can actually reliably perform constitutive modeling. Yeah, that was it. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Helen. Uh, now we have uh, time for questions, so we open the floor for that. So first, we are going to take some questions here in person, and maybe if there are some in the chat, just write your question in the chat, and we'll read them. So uh, one question here. Just get the mic so people online can hear what you say. Hi, thank you. Very nice work. I was um, wondering if you had considered including the history of the process. So in the experiments at the, at the beginning of, of, of the brain, uh, we see that there's a difference between the cycles, no? There's a response for the first cycle, then... Oh, you mean in the iteration? Or yeah, in, yeah. So, oh, I thought you were asking about this because no, this no, no, is in a the history uh, dependent network. Yeah. So this is a neural network that incorporates history, so it's an RNN, so... Um, but in the other, in the elastic mm -hmm. networks here, for example, um, we uh, do not incorporate any history, but we obviously map or look at the um, convergence of the loss function over the number of epochs. And mm -hmm. that's what you're asking for. It runs in about uh, 8,000 epochs for, for each of these. Mm -hmm. So it converges relatively smoothly. We have never really had ex um, run into problems that there's oscillations in in the loss function. So it really converges uh, to in like, I would say, 5,000 to 8,000 steps, we can stop this. And then it's reduced by, I think, 10 or uh, 10 to the power of four or so. Okay, okay, thank you. Yeah, question over here. Alan, uh, very impressive work. Uh, so I have a question. Now, 
this is uh, for uh, tissues and hyperelastic material, but it seems that this uh, principle uh, may apply to constitutive models of uh, various kind of materials. You just change those functions, right? That's yeah. how we do constitutive modeling. Based on physics, we come up with some functions. These are the laws. Uh, if you embed this, so you can expand the territory really beyond, uh, you know, this uh, hyperelastic or uh, you know, tissue-like materials. Then uh, it seems that this is a uh, constitutive law GPT. <laughs> so we're talking about the chat GPT, right? Yeah. Uh, in the future, many constitutive law, right? Uh, you say, uh, can you come up with a constitutive law? This is my experiment data. That may be the future. Maybe I should hire you as a sales. Oh, thank you. I hope <laughs> I have the uh, opportunity. Yeah, yeah no, um, so you're right. So what you could, for instance, do, these are all incompressible. So the next step, so first of all, we've already done like a little bit of anisotropic with fiber directions. It can learn the fiber directions from the data. Uh, you could also introduce uh, J, so to in incorporate comp uh, compressibility. You could also, but that would become a little more tricky, have coupling. So a lot of models have coupling of the first and second, third invariant with, or first and second with J. Um, so then you'd have a network. You've probably noticed the architecture here is it really never cross couples. If you cross couple certain terms, there might be terms that multiply the first and second invariant. Then it's a little more difficult to show polyconvexity, and that's why we haven't done that. Uh, and then you have to go back and maybe enforce that later. But once you start cr cross coupling the invariants or having the incompressibility constraint built in, then that might become an issue. But maybe that's not even an issue if you want to fit the data. All models are not only compressible. Yeah. 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 And uh, now you just have a general framework for selection. And then, I mean, like many of you know, if you want to have a history, like in plasticity, damage, viscosity, you would just run over the network and loop over. Right now, it's a uh, feed-forward network. It just feeds information, reads out. But then if you have a recurrent network, you can ask, you would treat your integration internal variables in, in a finite element framework. You could update the network every step. Yeah, great point. Okay, we are gonna take now a question online uh, by Mosen. So, um, it's about uh, extrapolation. So how good are now these new models doing uh, for extrapolation? Uh, question number one. And then question number two, how does it compare with uh, symbolic regression? That's a good point. So in terms of extrapolation, I haven't shown this here because I'm not continuing here. But you can imagine that this function is not flattening out because simply how, how we designed it. So it would go up. It can extrapolate only obviously in the elastic regime if something fails that's not built into the model. So if this now goes down because there's a physical deviation from what the model is trained on, then it can't. But it wouldn't have these unnatural things that happen because of the activation function. And the second question, yeah, it, uh, it could probably be sim similarly done with any optimization. You could use symbolic regression. So essentially we're minimizing loss functions. But we talked earlier this morning and what's really powerful about these tools is that they're just so fine-tuned in optimizing so we're just actually, in a way, hijacking the network optimization schemes from deep learning. And you could probably use any other scheme to minimize a loss function. Yeah, you're right. It's a totally good question, yeah. Um, okay, we're going to take those now. There's a couple more questions here. Great talk. Thank you, Ellen. Very interesting work. So I'm wondering how, uh, how robust is this solution during the training process? So, I mean, of course, uh, when, when it comes to a big model like this one, you know, when you're fitting all these parameters, it can, the optimization problem can get really, I mean, highly non-convex, yeah. right? So yeah. you may have many uh, local, you know, uh, minima. So um, how does it work from that perspective? Yeah, so, I mean, I can just comment on our experience. We have select, so the more these are orthogonal, the easier it will find minima, right? If they're very close to one another, it's becoming very different, difficult. Um, Matthias, for instance, Killings has tried to do it on um, hard tissue, which is autotrophic, and you have more invariants here. And he's just said, okay, let me just throw in everything I have. You can come up with like 10 invariants here and combine, and then have, I don't know how many weights and stuff. But then it really becomes tricky. I think you kind of, th the idea is to really reduce it to some basis from which you learn. And it's not a complete, like you throw the kitchen sink at it and just with everything you find something. So the terms have to be somehow set up that they're orthogonal. Otherwise, you probably end up in the same like overfitting uh, category that you would with normal neural networks. It's a good point, yeah. 
Okay, then our next question is going to be here. Thanks for the great talk. Uh, my question was related to your train test splitting. Um, so I, I think if I understood correctly when you were talking about, um, like for example, training on um, shear and testing on um, tension or, or something like that, I, I think I understood the motivation for that was to reduce the number of experiments you, you would have to do, is, is that right? So you could just um, do one set of experiments and then be able to predict the other, is that? Um, so there's multiple reasons why we um, tested on this. This is probably the furthest away. So if you take, for instance, this is a, a shear test where we trained on shear. Um, we could, I mean, ideally you could also just train on one sample and then try to test the other samples, right? Um, that would be easier and that would probably be much easier to fit and you would find test values that are much closer to one. When you do a test on something that's a real different experiment, like, for instance, here, if you train um, on tension and then you do the shear experiment and predict that, that's actually much more challenging, right? So we talk a lot about in the lab and actually with, with others what is a good training and what is a good test set, and I don't know if that's really entirely known. Um, I don't know if you have any suggestions. So this is training on one just one data set. You could test on different brain experiments, in this case shear, in the same region, right? and then you would probably find a relatively similar fit. One thing you would probably uh, run into is that there's this huge variation of brains that I've shown at the very beginning, right? And that's just a biological variation. So I don't even know if I were to test Daniel's brain if it would have the same stiffness as mine, if that's something you want, right? So that, I think in biology that's always a problem. Ideally, what an application that we have in mind is if you take like a healthy sample and you get, eventually we want to do this in the Bayesian setting, so if you get a Bayesian distribution of the stiffness in a healthy brain, and then you get another distribution that has a certain distance from it, uh, then you can probably um, do it as a classification between healthy and diseased tissues, arteries, brains, or whatever. Right? But for that, you can't really do point values, and you probably need to do it over a Bayesian setup. Yeah, and it's a good, good point. It's a very my, my question that, um, like, is this the best way to do train test? And it sounds like... Um, yeah, there's a lot of other ways, but as long as you're doing it in a, in a way that's um, trying to capture the type of generalizability that you would want in practice, I, I think it works. And it sounds like this is one way of doing that, but you've thought about yeah, well, some other interesting ways Yeah, well, this is testing whether you generalize to other experiments, right, right, or to other stress terms. If you wanted to test whether you generalize from my brain to someone else's here in the audience, then you would have to just use this within all the same tests. Mm. Yeah, that's a good point. Actually, there's not just, I guess, not just one way to test and train because it's such a rich data set overall. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna take one more question here. Helen, thank you for that. Uh, I'm more of a machine learning scientist, so mm -hmm. not, a, not a mechanical engineering scientist. Uh, I was wondering how, how this would extend to you know, highly nonlinear behaviors, you know, um, for, uh, you know, like torque or like breaking points of materials when they're under extreme pressures uh, and so on. And uh, once you start getting into this highly nonlinear behaviors, which is where machine learning actually works pretty well, um, which is different than, you know, fitting it to a smoother functions that you're looking at. What's, yeah, what's your yeah. take there? So, yeah, I think this, this is only elastic. I think when we talk, we can generalize this. I think for now, probably we're talking about only elastic behavior. When you say fracture or um, yield or damage, that would have to be a whole different set of um, physics that you would probably need to build in. So for those things, I think you're probably much better off if you don't want to put in any knowledge to use standard neural networks. Yeah. Because I mean, here is a, a very subset of, and I mean, materials are usually elastic to a certain range. So if you look at a small deformation range, you probably find but you're right, if you want to really look at something cracking, then I wouldn't know if this, this would probably not be able to predict it. We are working on this in the Yeah, that'd be great. Hi, thank you for your talk. Um, I was just wondering if you'd considered um, maybe like doing this setup in like a more classical like optimization um, as opposed to like this neural network framework, because um, it seems to me this, is, since you're using such small networks, um, you could use more sophisticated, sophisticated optimization algorithms, something like a Newton method or like a quasi-Newton method, and get faster convergence. 
that's true. Your convergence would probably be faster, um, especially if you some of these things you can linearize by hand. So that's true. Um, the reason why we use this is because we want to be able to just simply add functions. Um, one thing that is nice is that actually gives you, so we want to ultimately do Bayesian. So we want to be able to use the whole machine learning framework and machinery. Um, for this, it's probably, you're right, it's probably an overkill for what we're doing. Um, but the algorithms are pretty stable, so that has served as well. So yeah, but it's a good point. I mean, in the end, it's an optimization problem. Yeah. I think that there are maybe a few more questions online, but hopefully you can follow up later with Helen. Uh, I think that now we, this is uh, now time to wrap up. So thanks a lot, Helen, and thanks all of you. Hopefully see you next seminar.